All right, how are we doing? Are you still with me? All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about inner healing, but it's going to take me a little while to get there. That, that portion of it's not going to be that long, but I want to lay some groundwork and answer, answer a few questions. But let me pray before I get started. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our midst. There's so many people being sent out, different ministries starting. Um, Lord, it's just exciting to see your saints actively involved in, in ministry as you, as you lead them, as you direct them. Um, and uh, we know, Lord, that you give us, you, you give us these passions. You, you design them when we're being designed in our mother's wombs. I mean, we're, we're, we're born with a lot of these things. We have to nurture them and mature in them. But, Lord, you, you have woven this in, into us and who we are. So, Lord, we thank you for that calling and uh, not only birthing it, but helping it come to maturity. So we just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this may seem like a strange place to start, uh, a, a message on inner healing, but um, I want to start in Revelation. So <laughs> it makes sense. Well, uh, we know that John, I taught through Revelation, and I, I taught through the first few, few chapters, so some of you are familiar with this, and some of you are familiar with the letters that, that uh, John sent to the seven churches. But I want to share a little bit about the, the direction, the admonishment that, that John gave to these seven churches. He was, on, he was exiled to the, the island of, of Patmos, and he, he, was, he was instructed by Jesus Christ himself to write these things down in a scroll in letters that circulated among the, the church, and I think there were specific, there might have been specific letters that probably were sent to these individual churches, uh, seven churches, existing churches that were in Asia. And uh, John, John gives them specific instruction that, were, that was prophetically given to him by revelation from the Holy Spirit and, and through Jesus, Jesus Christ himself on um, things that, that these particular churches need to pay, pay attention to. And I just want to share some of that, and you'll understand why in a minute. So... He first starts to the church in Ephesus, and this, this church is, if you have a subtitle in your Bible, it's called the Loveless Church. He said that, that they, were, they were hardworking people who endured and hated evil, um, but they had no love in them. You know, that's hard. it's hard to believe that you can be a, about the work of the ministry and not have love in you. It becomes about tradition you know, going, going through the motions, but you've lost the love. You, you've lost your first love for, for, for Jesus himself. But even, and if you lose that, you're going to lose your love for people. So John was saying, you lost your first love. You, you need to do something about this. Then the church in Smyrna, he called the persecuted church. There was no rebuke for this persecuted church. So we'll just kind of move on. Pergamum, this is called the worldly church. This was the tolerant church. And this kind of reminds me of like progressive theology, where it seems like they're adopting all the ways of the world. There's a, there's a theology out there that's progressive theology that's adopting the philosophies of the world and quite frankly calling good evil and evil and evil good. It kind of reminds me of that church, but it was called the worldly church. They allowed sin like idols, immorality, cults, heresies. You think we have problems. This early church had problems too. There's nothing new under the sun. The, 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 the church kind of re repeats history when it takes its eyes off of Christ. Then there's the church in Thyatira. And this is the wrong doctrine church. Actually, that, that was the progressive church. Um, it said they have love and faith and good works, but there were doctrinal issues that inter infiltrated the church. They were practicing idolatry, sexual sin, and even pagan traditions. You know, a lot of the early church who were Gentiles, they were, they were pagans, and they started to bring some of, their, some of their traditions and some of their practices into the church. And, and the church leadership didn't do anything about it. As a matter of fact, they adopted some of those ways. The church in Sardis is called the spiritually dead church. Almost all per people in the church of Sardis had fallen asleep spiritually. He was, he was asking that the church needs to be rekindled and, and revive itself. Then there's the church in Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. No, it's not the same church, but it was a spiritually alive church, and there was no rebuke for this church. And then the last church, which for some reason I'm not scrolling, is the church of Laodicea. This is called the lukewarm church. And uh, they received a rebuke for being lukewarm. It said their reliance on riches and things of this world resulted in lukewarm. So they were, 
They were living, living comfortably and they became lukewarm. They, they took their eyes off of the first love. And the reason why, why I mentioned these churches, because if we apply these things to our individual lives, we could probably see some of those things in us. Maybe it's not bowing down to a specific idol, but maybe, maybe it's a passion that's become almost like a religion to us. Maybe, maybe we, we, we have to watch this particular episode or, or we're in a miserable mood or we, we just, whatever. I mean, it could be anything. We can turn anything into idolatry. You can turn relationships into idolatry. Worldliness that creeps in, you know, this, this dullness, this apathy that creeps in, you know, different stages in our spiritual work, walk, we probably experience these exact same things. So this is going to lead, in this conver- lead me into this conversation about inner healing, but it's going to take me a little while to get there because I want to answer some questions. There are things that, that when we become born again, when we get saved, we just, we just get. Stuff that, that God turns on, we don't, we don't, I mean, you can never earn salvation anyhow, but they're just things that God just gives you. And I want to I wanna explain that to you because I think some, some believers don't quite understand what they've already been given. I mean, you've already been given everything that you need for life and godliness because the Holy Spirit is, is in you. But there are certain things that were accomplished on the cross and his resurrection that, that every born-again believer receives just automatically. You, you just get. I want to share about those, but then there's the continued work. We call that, there's a theological term called sanctification. You know, we, we, we continue to grow in his ways. As, as we read the word and we apply the word, we begin to become more like Christ. Those things I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, but I want to know, I want you to know what you've already see, received. And the reason why I want to go through this some of you have heard this, but some might be visiting for the first time or they, they might be viewing online and they, they don't know this. I hear, I hear songs, worship songs all the time, pleading for stuff that the Lord has already given people. So that's why I think it's really important to know what you've already been given as a believer and then you need to know what you need to do for the, the continued work of the Holy Spirit so that you can become refined and, and look more like Jesus. But since Apostle Ron started in, in Genesis when he came up to share, I figured I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue the story. I want to read a passage in Genesis 2-7. I think that we need to know how we are made up. We're not just flesh, but we're, we're spirit. We have, a, we have a soul. And you need to identify what those are because there's certain things in that transformation process that you get. And then there are other things that are not fully transformed yet, like your mind, that you have to continue to renew. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Breath there is a, is a Hebrew word called ruach, and it's, it's, it means spirit. So the spirit came from God. The body was formed out of the, out of the dust of the earth. If you don't know this, when you die, you turn into dirt. I mean, that's what you do. You, you literally turn into dirt. You become fertilizer after a while. Your bones break down and you become dirt. God made Adam's body, his physical body, from the dust of the earth. So the spirit came from God. The body was formed from the dust of the ground. And the soul came into being when the spirit of God breathed into man. So when, when picture the spirit like the energy of God. God breathed into Adam, breathed into this lifeless body, and his soul came into existence, all right? First Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the three parts of men, right? You got that? Spirit, soul, and body. There's another aspect of man that sometimes is confused and connected to the soul or the mind, but it's interesting. It seems like the scripture talks a lot about this particular part of the body, and it seems to be talking about something very different, and that's called the heart. The Greek word for heart is cardia, and and the Hebrews considered the heart, even the physical heart, the core of the being. It wasn't the mind, which is kind of interesting. That came through Greek influence and philosophy, to the Hebrews, the core of the being was actually in the heart. Not specifically the heart, but, but Scripture does say life, life is in the blood, so it was kind of connected to the heart. But the core of the being, the Hebrews considered the, the heart of a person. So the heart is in 
the physical body. We know the physical body has a physical heart pumping. If the heart's not pumping, the physical body dies. But there's also a spiritual heart in the, in the spirit or in, in the soul. Because when you die, you, you go somewhere, right? But you're still you. The brain dies, right? The physical body dies. What doesn't die? The soul does not die. And the soul contains the heart, your, 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 your personhood. Just think of it as your personhood. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence. From it flows the, the spring or the issues of life, depending on what version you're reading. A person with a strong heart will defy logic and overcome great adversity. You know that there's something in you that's like, that sometimes defies logic. If you're passionate about something or you... You know, you just feel like you can accomplish this thing and you think about it rationally and think, this does not make rational sense, but I think that I can do this thing. I think this is in me. That's, that's in your heart. That's in your soul. That's in the soul of your being. And that actually really conducts and navigates your life. That's why the scripture encourages you to guard, guard your heart. Romans 10.10 10 says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It is with your heart, not your mind. They knew about the mind. They knew about the brain. They knew about thinking. This wasn't a mistake that it was communicated this way. This is talking about the, the heart or the center of our being that motivates our, our, our passions and really, really makes decisions for us. The heart governs the mind. For example, a person can easily learn something they're passionate about. I learned this with my kids. If I was teaching something that they were not passionate about or a teacher in high school was teaching them something that they weren't passionate about, they did not do well. They didn't do well at all. But the thing that they were, if you tapped into their passion, it seemed like they became experts. Sometimes, often they become experts in things that have nothing to do with academics. You know, but, but sometimes they, they do. They have, they have a passion for numbers or they have a passion for, for sports or they have a passion for art. You know, if you tap into someone's passion, they, they will just absorb information. You barely have to teach it to them. It's like they just seem to be wired that way. I mean, all my kids are so uniquely different. They all have, real, they're all pretty artistic, but they all have specific giftings. And it's, it's what, it's, it's the thing that God put in them to pursue. Maybe it's not going to be a career, but it's going to be something that he uses for his glory. Maybe it's music or, or art or, or, or dance or, or being good with numbers. Um, those, are, those are things that God designs in, 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 a, in every individual. They're specific things, unique to every individual, but they're, they're in the heart of a person. They're, they're part of who they are, their soul. I like what Harold Everly says. Desires seated in the heart of a person orient that person's thoughts down a corresponding path. So it's your heart, it's your passions that actually kind of direct your life. Luke 6.45 says, A good man brings good things out of, out of the good stored up in his heart, not in his mind, his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks, that the heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You know, this is why it's pretty ineffective sometimes to win an argument, to change some person's mind because they have a wrong philosophy or a wrong idea. It's because you have to change that the Lord, or you have to pray that the Lord changes their heart before their mind is changed. That's why, that's why prayer is so important for a believer. We're, you know, I, I, have, I have rarely ever argued someone into salvation. Matter of fact, it typically backfires on me because they dig in their heels, I dig in my heels. It's, it's not very effective. But if you, cha if you pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to change their heart, then their thoughts begin to change. That's the super, because that's the core of a person's being. And that can only be changed supernaturally by God and through prayer. Amen? Amen. This is why when a person becomes born again, he or she is given a new heart, which is oriented to, to Christ's likeness. In Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, it prophesies when Jesus comes, he dies and he's resurrected and people can become born again for, because of Christ's sacrifice and his resurrection life. Ezekiel eleven nineteen 19 says, I will give them an undivided heart and I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. When you get saved... You have a spirit, because that, otherwise you wouldn't be living. It's the spirit of God that brings us, brings us life. But there's something that happens in the spirit 
when you get saved, it's like the light switch comes on and it's like you recognize that there's, there's something more to your being. He also gives you a new heart. And the new heart is, is directed in, it's like your compass, it's directed towards him. When a person is saved, they may not be perfect. They may still use bad language. They may still make bad decisions because their mind is not renewed yet. They have to go through that process of sanctification. And none of us are never going to arrive at that perfected state until we get our new bodies. You know, we don't have to deal with sin, sin in, 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 anymore. But it says in scripture that we're giving, given a new spirit our spirit comes alive and we're given a new heart that is oriented towards God. If, if, you, if you meet anybody who is just born again, they should have different thoughts. There should be a different ori- orientation. You know, they, they, they may still swear occasionally, but you should definitely notice a significant change. That's, that's how I know, like you know them by their fruit. That's how I know whether someone has le- legitimately been born again or they were just moved by emotion and they made a mental ascent to some higher philosophy. There are, I mean, Scripture is pretty clear that there are some people that think that they're saved that they're not. But this is what concerns me by this statement that I just made. There are some people that worry whether they're saved or not because they still struggle with sin. Believers still struggle with sin because their mind is not fully renewed. You know, they have stinking thinking or they have trauma or they have insecurities. God's going to work that out and I believe God wants to mature us, so we, we do less of that. We are less insecure. Um, we are less sinful. Certainly, as we grow in the Lord and mature in the Lord, we should sin a whole lot less. But there are believers, or so-called believers, that it doesn't seem like their life has changed at all. They have the same friends. They participate in the same conversation, the, the, the same sort of jokes, and nothing has changed about them. It's not my responsibility to judge them, but I'm certainly going to pray for them. But you shouldn't be struggling with an understanding that you think that you might not be saved because you still occasionally sin. If I asked you questions like, do you want to please God? Anybody who's a believer is going to say, I want to please God. Do you love the Lord? Yes, I I love the Lord. Do you want to continue in this sin? No, I don't want to continue in this. Then you're saved. You can just ask yourself various questions. You're, if your heart is oriented towards God, not perfect yet, but oriented toward, towards God, then you're saved. It's because God has given you a new heart. There's a, a spiritual transaction that takes place. Literally, something amazing, Scripture calls it a metamorphosis that happens in you. Basically, you're, you're an ugly caterpillar, an ugly caterpillar, and now you're a beautiful butterfly. You're, I'm a beautiful butterfly. What was that bug's life? The fat caterpillar who got the little wings. Didn't look like he changed much, had a hard time flying around. But literally, that happens to you when you get saved. You are miraculously transformed, and you are given a new heart and a new spirit. That's something to celebrate. Amen? All right, so what does it mean to be saved or born again? Romans 8, 1, 4 through, 4 through 8. I think it's 4 through 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, so any Christian, any believer that, that, that deals with shame or condemnation, that's of the devil, has nothing to do with God. If you're a born-again believer, you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to feel like you're, you're condemned for the bad things that, you, that, that you've done. You, you're forgiven of those things. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened, it was talking about the Old Testament law that did really nothing about sin, it was weakened by the flesh. God did, God did by sending his own son into the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned the sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in, in us. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That was Paul saying to you that you no longer live according to the flesh. What Christ did is a done deal you know, so this whole business about fighting, fighting with the flesh, like my flesh wants it, it's not biblical. God, God has died on the cross for your, your, your flesh. The issue is this and what you put into your heart. That's the issue. Those are the things that need continued transformation. We need to focus on the right things if we're going we're, we're to begin to live a victorious life. This is why I'm starting here. Paul said, if you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead 
and accept and acknowledge Jesus as Lord, you are saved. Simple. That's it. You don't got to say some fancy prayer. You don't got to bow 10 times. Paul said, if you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, you will not believe that Jesus is raised from the dead if, if, if you aren't open to listening to what God is communicating to you. That, that comes through a divine transaction also, because how can you prove that Jesus was raised from the dead? I can't prove that, not scientifically. There's, some, there's historical evidence. There's a Bible. I believe it in faith. There are certain things that you have to believe in faith, but God's got to give you that initial infusion of faith for you to believe it. But if you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, he was resurrected, and you acknowledge him as Lord, you are saved. That's scripture. That's what scripture says. It's not a fancy prayer. It's not a dance. It's not a jig. It's simply recognizing those two things. Jesus says, Lord, what does that mean? You give Jesus authority, power, and control over your life. Jesus becomes Lord over everything about you. He comes, becomes Lord over your mind, Lord over your heart, Lord over your passions, Lord over your desires, Lord over your speech, Lord over your actions. You make him Lord. That's a progressive process, making him Lord over all those areas, over your family, over your marriage, all those things. But he has to become Lord. John 3.3 3 says, Jesus replied, replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. I know some people get scared off by that expression. It's in the Bible. Except a man may be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. People that don't read their Bible are scared of that term. You know, depending on what denomination you're from. I know people that have been raised in the church that have never actually read what born again means in scripture. And they hear that and they're, they're immediately criticizing, oh, those born again Christians. You know, born again is a scriptural term. And it means that, that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and, a tra and transformation has taken place. You have literally become born again from a pure spiritual perspective. I've actually seen people's physical countenance change when they get saved. I mean, so you can, you can see a different in person. It's like the, the, they're lighter. It, doesn't, it, feel, it looks like they don't have anxiety or stress anymore. God has done, you can see that in their count, countenance. So you can see it physically manifest, but that's not primarily what happens. What primarily happens, he gives you a new heart and your spirit comes alive. Jesus resurrected and then ascended and Christ became a life-giving spirit. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father doing something. It actually says we are, in seated, we are seated in heavenly places. I don't know what that means like for our spirit. Maybe our spirit is up there all the time in heavenly places. Or there's this constant connection between us and Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding. I don't know, my mind just goes crazy when I think about what, what all that means. You know, but, but, but Jesus becomes a life-giving spirit. It's like our spirits are communing together. You know, our, our very life, our very existence is connected really in, in a pretty incredible, interesting way to Jesus. Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts in the spirit who calls Abba Father. The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is in our hearts. Not in our physical heart, but in the core of our being. A Christian should act Christ-like. That does not mean that Christians can, cannot act sometimes like they're not looking or sounding like Christ. But normally, they should look a lot like Jesus and sound a lot like Jesus. And if they're not, maybe you need a sozo, maybe you need deliverance, or maybe you need to get saved. I, I don't know. But there should be a dramatic difference between a believer. Believers should not be acting like people of the world. I've seen a lot of that the past couple of years. I think one of the things that, that had been exposed is where people's hearts are in the church. God will use persecution, trials to refine his people and remove weeds sometimes in the church. So we're given a new heart. And a new spirit, and that means that we are born again. John 3, 6, and 7, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. It's exactly, well, not exactly, but it's very similar to what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden before, before sin. I, God is trying to bring us back to the garden. The sort of intimacy that he had with Adam and Eve when, when he walked with them. 1 John 5, 11 through 12 says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, 
And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Now, we've talked about us having a new heart and a new spirit or our spirit has been awakened and the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us. The spirit of God is in every believer. Think about that. I don't know how much you contemplate that, but whenever I contemplate that, I'm blown away by this. God wants to live in me, which is really surprising to me because sometimes my thoughts go to play. It's like, why would you want to hang out with me? You know, but, but the Spirit of God is in every believer. So we're obviously, we obviously recognize that we're still a little broken. Sometimes we don't have right thoughts. Sometimes we struggle with insecurities. You know, Jonathan was mentioning one of those. He was afraid. I was afraid of public speaking, and God makes me a pastor who has to get up here and preach almost every Sunday. I mean, go figure. You know, but, but you know, we, because of certain experiences, because of a certain trauma or criticism when we were younger, or not having a mom and dad who really encouraged us, we, we, we tend to take that kind of stuff, that kind of thinking into our walk with, with, with us. And sometimes it keeps us back from the destiny and the victory that God has for us. Well, Scripture talks about that. In Romans 12, 1 and 3, it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which you can do. You can present your bodies a living sacrifice because you've been born again. Holy and acceptable to God, you need to know that. You're holy and acceptable to God. This is the work that Jesus did. It doesn't matter whether you're not perfect or not. You're holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But he says this, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are, we've been saved. We're saved now. We're being saved, right? Right? We're, we're being transformed. Our, our, mind is, our mind is being transformed. It says, don't be conformed to the world or the world's way of thinking or doing things, the world system, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You will know the good and acceptable, perfect will of God if you continue that process of renewing your mind. For I say, though grace be given to me to everyone who is among you, Paul explains this in more detail in Ephesians 4, through 24. He says that in reference to your former way of life, your former way of life, you're a believer now, you don't live that way anymore, your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self. The old self is in here, and your heart, even though you've been given a new heart, you have to train your mind to think differently. You have to redirect your passions, and you could do that because you've been given a new heart. And your heart can take command of your mind. But that's what renewing the mind is. So you need to rid yourselves of your old self. So put off your old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And to put on the new self. You have to put on the new self by renewing your thinking. This is the real problem. Your thoughts. Scripture has a lot to say about thoughts. I'm going to share some of those scriptures. Paul tells us that renewing our mind involves taking off and putting something on. We do this in several different areas. We take off the old self and put on the new self. You let go of the cultural perspective of the spirit of this age, and you put on the biblical perspective. I've seen so many believers fall in the trap of the spirit of this age the past couple years. Fall into pointing fingers, criticizing, lumping people into groups because you're part of a particular political party. You must believe this and you are like this. That is worldly thinking. That is not godly thinking. We need to abandon worldly thinking in worldly ways and adopt biblical thinking. All those politics are important. We need to be supporting people who believe in biblical values. I don't care what party they're from, but, but we have to have godly thinking, God re- God, godly reactions, and godly actions. We can't be pointing fingers like everybody else points finger. We, ha- we have to be praying for all of our leaders, whether you elected, elected them or not, because why? The Bible tells us that we're supposed to pray for everyone. Maybe we're praying that they be removed from office, but you have to be praying for them. You don't pray for their destruction. You don't pray for their demise. You pray, that you, you pray the will of God, but you pray for them. I mean, 
at least pray that they get saved. Maybe if they get saved, that could happen, you know. If enough believers are praying for a particular individual, that their heart would begin to be open, which the Holy Spirit can do through your prayers. Look at Paul. Paul murdered Christians. They were praying for Paul. What happened to Paul? He had a Damascus Road experience. If Paul can change, then any of these elected officials who are tyrants and ungodly can change. I don't care what party they're from. We need to let go of the cultural perspective, the way the world system, the way the world does things and operates in, and, and put on the biblical perspective. We need to take lies off and replace them with truth. That's what sozos do. Inner healing and renewing the mind can happen outside of a sozo. A sozo is not an answer. You can have your own personal sozo hanging out with the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But sometimes he puts ministers in our life to kind of help us get there. Sometimes he'll, because you're, we, can be so hard-headed sometimes, he'll have to send somebody along and say, you're really hard-headed and stubborn. The Lord wants me to tell you this because he's told you this 10 times and you'd ignored him. But out of love, I want to share this with you. Sometimes, don't, doesn't he send people like that? I have, I've had a lot of people like that in my life. My father's been one of them. So has my mother. She, she brought a partner with her, though. It was called the wooden spoon. I think she broke a couple on my derriere, I'm pretty sure. So let go of what we've learned growing up and put on what we've learned in the Bible. I, I have had close personal friends that I've counseled, spiritual sons that, I, that I've counseled that have experienced stuff that I cannot repeat. And they, were, they, they dealt with those into, into adulthood, but it's amazing what the Lord did to them as they, as they found forgiveness for those individuals who, who committed those things. That, that does not release them from the responsibilities and the consequences of their action, the perpetrator. But they, they, they were able to find forgiveness. They let go of those, offen- those offenses, and I just, I just saw these people being transformed. I mean, God, God can do this. But with that process of renewing our mind, we need to learn how to capture our thoughts. I'm almost done. This is really important, so you're just going to have to hang out a little while longer. 2 Corinthians 10.5. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. We have to recognize that as, as believers. We, we so often get irritated with people just like the world gets irritated with people, and we should not because we don't fight p- people. We don't fight against people. We don't fight against flesh and blood. That person that you're thinking about right now and you're angry about because for, for whatever, it's not the person. There's something that controls the person. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight with the same weapons that the world fights with. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You know what a stronghold is? It's a place of protection. Sometimes we build strongholds thinking that it's going to protect us from ever getting hurt again. Because we've had a lot of broken relationships. We've had people harm us. So we, we build these walls around us. The problem is the walls don't just keep people out. It keeps you in. And those strongholds become a, become a prison. An argument is a false philosophy in a teaching of the day. I've seen the church run with false philosophies before. We have to cast those things down. We have to recognize that they're false philosophies. And a pretension is a satanic t- attack or demonic claim or assertion. We can, we can be given to a demonic claim if we latch on to it, if we don't apply, if we don't spend time in, in the Word and we don't spend time walking with, walking with the Lord and growing in our discernment, growing in our revelation. You know how many believers have been led astray by crazy philosophies? I know people from this very church that, that are involved in, in, in a cult today that were actually ministry leaders in the church. The Lord identified one of the major things. It was because offense. They were offended. They never forgave. And when you're, when you're offended and you don't forgive, you're given over to delusion. It's like, it's like you open the door to an enemy, the enemy and say, come in and make, it make a mess of my life and confuse me. That's what strongholds and arguments and pretensions are. This thought, what's a thought? It's a concept, right? 
or, or an idea. It says to take that thought captive. Taking your thoughts captive simply means gaining control over what you think about yourself and about, about your life. The enemy is always around you lying to you, trying to discourage you, trying to derail you. Sometimes he uses Christians to do it. Like you share this crazy idea with somebody, your, your, your close friend, this thing that God is telling you to do and that because this friend knows you so well. I'm not saying that you should look at, look at suspicion with people, but sometimes, sometimes he'll use the people closest to you. We saw that with David, King David. Sometimes he'll use the people closest to you because something's going on in their life or they have insecurities to derail you and discourage you from what God has called you. That's why your relationship is so key. You can't depend on me. And you won't be able to blame me for where you are on the day that you go home and see the Lord and you've got to answer for your, your deeds and your works. You can't say, well, Pastor Dave, you're your own person. You've got to check out what I'm telling you. You know, you've got to check out the word. You can't depend on someone else's prophetic word over you. You, you, should, you, should, you should take that prophetic word. You need to pray about it. You need to cultivate it. You need to make sure that it lines up with Scripture. And then, and then let the Lord confirm it. Never, never rely on just one person. Never rely on just the multiple counselors, which are all good things. You need to have your own relationship with the Lord. You need to hear from the Lord. You need to learn how to hear from the Lord yourself. And you won't be able to do that unless your mind is renewed and you, you develop intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you can capture these ideas and you test it. Um, I'm going to mention just a couple more things, and I'll, I'll be closing up in about 10 minutes. Um, I want to turn you on to somebody by the name of Dr. Carolyn Leaf. How many of you have heard of her? She's brilliant. She's a neuroscientist, but she's a, she's a believer. She gained notor notoriety because she started working with pa patients who had traumatic brain injuries, like, or, or like extreme trauma, or they were accident vic victims. And I think she worked with like, like a large group of people in Africa and War to, the war-torn parts of Africa, she would go in and she would help them rebuild their brain. And she's got this, she's got this book called Detox Your Brain. I read it once and I'm going to read it again. But she says, you need to harness the power of mind management and find healing and fulfillment. Now, she's, she, has a, she brings her scientific knowledge and her spiritual knowledge of renewing, renewing the mind. There, there are things that can physiologically change in your mind as your mind is renewed. If, if she can help traumatic brain in, injured people find healing, then certainly we can find healing in our mind, you know, from our, our trauma or our past experiences. And she has a five-step five way of doing this, and it's, I, think it's, I think she's a prophet. You know, I just think she's a prophet. God, the Holy Spirit has just given her incredible revelation so people can walk in freedom. You can manage your mind. You realize that? What is capturing your thoughts? It means that you can manage your thoughts. Some of the thoughts that you have probably are because of the stuff that you watch or the stuff that you listen to or the lies that you believe. If you remove them and replace them with biblical truth, then you can manage your mind. It, these are spiritual principles. The first step is gather awareness of your physical and emotional warning signs. You know, so in other words, when you, when, you, when you have a thought or something comes at you, she says you need to objectively look at it. You know, most people just respond. Something happens, somebody says something, they see something, they just respond, their emotions go off the rail, and they don't objectively think about it. So she's saying you got to take a step back and you got to reflect. That's number two, reflect on why you are feeling these things in your body and your mind. Think through your problems rather than just react to them. That's scripture. We are not supposed to act the way the world acts. If, if we have the fruits of the Spirit in us, we should not be reacting the way everybody else reacts. We he, and he warns us, anyhow, we're going to experience persecution. We're going to experience trials. He doesn't hide it. Everybody in scripture that you read about experiences the same thing. But it seems like, well, sometimes they, they were like epic fails. I mean, Peter, Peter messed things up. They, they, all, they all mess things up every once in a while. But that's because they didn't implement what Jesus was teaching them. So if, you, if, you, if you're in this, caught in this stressful situation, take a step back and begin to pray. Holy Spirit, center me. Calm me down. I shouldn't. You can fear, and then you can be paranoid. 
Fear can turn to paranoia. I mean, there's some elements of fear that are okay because they protect you. They keep you from walking out in the middle of the street and getting hit by cars. You know, they, they keep you from, from heights that you shouldn't, shouldn't be on, but they can, turn to, they can turn to paranoias. So you have to reflect on that information. And then she says, write it down. Write down your reflections and organize your thinking. Basically, what she's trying to do is she's trying to tell you, slow down. React to this stuff. It, and it may legitimately be a bad situation, but all things work together for good for those who are called to his purposes. You need to know that. If you don't know that, then you're thinking that this thing is going to destroy you. But if you know, well, wait a minute, I'm a son or daughter of God. He me, promises me, he doesn't promise that he's going to take that situation away, but he does promise that, that all things will work. It's going to, I'm going to work good out of this. It's a mess now. You may be sick now. You may be in this really difficult relationship, but all things are going to work together for good. And then she says, recheck what you have written down and how your thoughts and feelings have changed. And the fifth thing is active reach, taking action to recap, re, reconceptualize your thinking and find sustainable healing. These are scientifically proven methods to detox your brain. She's got a book. I'd encourage you to get it, Detox Your Brain. It's a scientific approach to what can happen to us spiritually in the process of renewing our mind. Get the book, Detox Your Brain. It's super cheap on Amazon. Um, so what do we mean by inner healing? This is going to be really short. Why are we still broken, some of us? Why are some of us so easily offended? Why are some of us quick-tempered? Why do some of us still seem to have addictive behaviors? By the way, this whole idea that you're, you're, you're connected to that addiction the rest of your life denies the work of Jesus in you. You can, you can at one time been an addict, but you're no longer an addict anymore. I mean, God, God wants to make all things new. You just have to change and renew your thinking. Why do some of us still deal with unforgiveness? Why are we frequently jealous or covetous of others? This is why inner healing is so important. And again, I'm not saying this a sozo, a, a, a sozo, I was going to call it the demonstration. What? what a session, appointment. This is why a sozo appointment can be absolutely effective. If you feel like you're, if you feel like you're stuck, then, then these folks can help you pray through it and, and, and connect with the Godhead. But you can do that all on your own also. But I kind of like doing it with people. Misery loves company. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's just, there's, it's, there's nothing that you've experienced that's uncommon to all men. You know, sometimes when we're going through the stuff of our life, especially if it's a traumatic thing, we feel alone. We feel like we're the only one who's gone through it. No one has experienced what I've experienced. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, maybe the person or the people that are praying with you have not experienced it, but Jesus has experienced every trauma that you've experienced. When he took on the sin of the world, there is nothing that any human being has experienced that he did not feel. He felt all the emotions of it. Anything that's connected to any sort of violence or sin, he experienced it when that, that sin was lumped on him. When he said, it, and he felt like God had forsaken him because all that sin, all that nastiness, all those thoughts were lumped on him. He can empathize with you and you always got Jesus. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence and from it flows the springs and issues of life. As we get healing, as we begin to walk in freedom, as our mind is, is, is renewed and we experience what it means to really walk and, 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 and live a victorious life, then we're going to see the shift that happens in our heart. Our passions are going to change. That, that, that orientation, that compass that is constantly drawing us to the feet of Jesus is going to draw us to the feet of Jesus. I want to encourage some of you. Some of you have had trauma, stuff happened to you in the past, insecurities, paranoias, addictions that you just can't seem to shake. I want to tell you that there is freedom in Christ. There is absolute freedom in Christ. There, there will be a day, if you, if you get in the Word and you develop a relationship with Jesus and develop a relationship with the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you will be free one day. I know it's discouraging. 
I've had things that just like re- recurring thoughts in my life that, that, that sometimes control my emotions that I just can't seem to get rid of, but I can assure you that I'm much better than I was. My wife can vouch for me. That wasn't a big nod. Thank you. Got to have that. But I want to assure you that there's freedom. And if, and if it takes a session, a sozo session, by all means, go for it. Amen? Amen. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your word. But most importantly, we thank you that you live through your word to perform it in us. We thank you for the incredible work that was done in us that, that, that brought this transformation, that, that gave us this born-again experience, this u- unique connection that we have with you. We no longer have to be ashamed. We no longer have to feel condemned. You took care of that Jesus on the cross, and you gave us the spirit of the life of you in us so that we can live out this victorious life so that our mind can be renewed. And we don't have to think about the same stuff that we used to think about. We don't have to be stuck anymore that we can walk in victory. And we just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.